You know, God has his way of making things come out just right. You know, that's an interesting thing. How does God work in the lives of his people? Let's go to Hebrews 11 and verse 1. Hebrews 11 and verse 1. I'm going to read this in the Kazir translation. Kazir was a, a, uh, a Jewish man who had grown up in Germany during the 1920s and 1930s. And when Hitler came to power, he and his family figured the getting was to get good and get out of Germany while they still could. And he went to, actually, he went to England and, um, and when he, as an adult, when he, later on, he became a famous scholar in some of the, one of the leading universities there in, in the United Kingdom. Anyways, Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1, Kazir puts it this way. Now faith is that which provides us with confidence, assurance with regard to things which we hope for. It serves by way of convicting us about things which cannot be seen. The Amplified makes this point. It says, it says, and it's perhaps more conventional, faith is the assurance. It's the assurance, the title deed, the confirmation as it, as it brings it out of things hope for, that is, things that are divinely guaranteed, what the Word of God promises. That's what we have faith in. The New Covenant word, the Greek word for faith, is Strong's 4102. It's pistis. I've talked about this before. It's per, it talks about to be persuaded, to come to trust. Biblical faith is always... As the lexicon will point out, a gift from God. It's never something that is worked up just by people. In short, you know, faith or pistis for the believer is God's divine inner persuasion. And therefore, it's distinct from human belief or confidence. But, as lexicon notes, it yet involves our confidence. It also, there is something that we extend of ourselves towards this too. And it says, the Lord continually births faith in the yielded believer, not somebody who has a stubborn and rejectionist heart. He, it, the Lord continuously births faith in the yielded believer so that they can know what? What he prefers, what his will is. And of course, they will want to do it. Let's go to 1 John, 1 John chapter 4 and, and uh, 1 John chapter 5, excuse me, in verse 4, New Living Translation. Why, you know, what is the, you know, what is so important? Faith is that which provides us with the confident assurance of, of things to come which we hope for. Convincing us of things that cannot be seen. 1 John 5, 4, the ultimate goal. What is the ultimate goal? It says, for every child of God, the Apostle John was saying, defeats this evil world. And this is an evil world. Whenever I listen to news and start to get off just with the mainstream press here in the North America is focusing on and start reading about what's going on in other places of the world, yeah, because they don't have an agenda. They will just be talking about news, things that is happening, the things that are happening. It makes a point that this world is evil. I can't believe some of the incredible things that go on in South Sudan and some of these other places, or he's still in Afghanistan on a daily basis. For every child of God defeats this evil world, and we achieve this victory through our faith. You now we're, we're here on earth to defeat this evil world and we're going to do it through our faith, through this confident assurance of things that are not seen, but yet we, you know, we, things we hope for, things we know, things that are, that are divinely guaranteed, what God promises he will deliver. What are some of the, of course, for a Christian, one of the, what is the greatest of these? Let's go to 1 Corinthians 15, 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 50. How does God work in the lives of his people? What is the promised victory? 
1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 50. I'm going to read this in the English Standard Version. So most of you, if you're following along with the King James Version or something else, it'll be very easy for you to do this. I tell you this, the Apostle Paul was writing. He's saying this, I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. It's a remarkable statement, that. Nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Well, there's a there's something there's something new that's coming down. There's something better that God has promised to His people. Verse fifty one, behold, I tell you a mystery: we shall not all sheep sleep, but we shall all be changed. Verse fifty two, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. We shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. We're not immortal right now. We don't have an immortal soul. This is, you know, if, if we did, Apostle Paul would have talked about this. But no, for this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass a saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? Then the Paul, Apostle Paul notes something, and this is very important for our times, for the sting of death is sin. Yeah, the presence of sin in our lives brings the sting of death, and the power of sin is the law. That's right, because there are consequences. The wages of sin is death. We, trans, you know, we transgress the law, and, and the law breaks us. But thanks be to God. Yes, that's right, because we're all sinners and fallen short of God. But thanks be to God who gives us a victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Because he is the propitiation, the substitute the sacrifice who pays the penalty for our sins. So let's go back to Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 2. Hebrews, how does God work in the lives of his people? Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 2, For it is by reason of their faith that our spiritual ancestors found themselves highly praised. It is faith which makes us apprehend, that is, makes us understand, to seize on to this, the, this, this, the reasoning, to seize on to the vision, that everything that ever has been throughout the ages has been fashioned by the word of God. The visible coming forth from something that does not outwardly appear. That's mind-blowing to a lot of people. Yeah, this universe is, does not have an eternity of existence. It has a definite starting point. And you know, there are a lot of physicists who've come to understand this. Where did it all come from? Well, this is the big question, and the Bible says that the visible came forth from something that does not appear, that it was fashioned by the Word of God, by spiritual power, spiritual resources. Let's just skip down here to Hebrews 11 and verse 6. But then, it's impossible that in the absence of faith, and this is the Apostle Paul writing here in Hebrews, that should <laughs> there should be any such thing as pleasing God in the absence of faith, you can't please God. For if anyone is to make his way towards God, it is necessary, first of all, that he should believe that God exists. Well, that's logical, isn't it? You don't believe God exists, how are you going to make your way towards him? That he should believe that God exists and that, secondly, that God has a recompense in store for those who are seeking him. Yes, we seek God. We must be seeking Him throughout our entire life. Because we, we walk with God. The just will live by faith. We walk and live with, by faith on a day-to-day -day basis. And this is nothing new. It has been something that the people of God have had to do for, from antiquity. You know, the 12th king of the kingdom of Judah was a man named Hezekiah, and he ruled Judah 
oh, if the, the scholars say about 727 to 698 BC. That's a long time ago. <laughs> it's a very long time ago. We're dealing with almost getting towards 3,000 years, 2,700 and you know, some odd years. That's a long time ago. During that period, it was he reigned during a period of time which at that time the you know, the chosen people, the 12 tribes of Israel had divided into two kingdoms and the northern kingdom of Israel had fallen during his reign, six years into, his, into the period of when he was king in 721 BC. They were, they were destroyed, the, the government and the, and the people were exiled just six years after Hezekiah came to power, and that happened in 721 BC. We know that. The evidence is right there. Some 20 years after Israel's fall, the northern kingdom was conquered by the Assyrians and destroyed, and the people exiled. Well, the Syrians came back, and this time they decided, ooh, we're hungry. Let's get the southern kingdom of Judah and swallow it too. They wanted to absorb it into their empire. Let's go here. Let's just take a look at this in 2 Kings, 2 Kings 18. We want to see a little bit about how the important role that faith plays in the lives of his people. Yes, we can't please God without faith. 2 Kings chapter 18 and verse 17. Chapter 18 and verse 17. The king of Assyria sent Tartan. Okay, this is one of his chief officers. My army officers and the chief of uh, and the chief of office officer and the chief field commander from Lachish, to King Hezekiah, uh, who is you know holed up in Jerusalem with a great army against Jerusalem, and they went up and came to Jerusalem, and when they had come up, they came and stood by the conduit of the upper pool, which is in the highway of the Fuller's Field, and they called to the king. And Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, who was over the household, and Shebna the scribe, then Joah, the son of Asaph, the recorder, went out to, to meet them. So some of, the, some of the, the, the chief officials in Hezekiah's government. And the field commander, that is the Assyrian field commander, said to them, Speak now to Hezekiah, thus says the great king, the king of Assyria. What confidence is this in which you trust? Do you say that a mere word of the lips is wisdom and strength for the war? Now on whom do you trust that you rebel against me? Okay, who, 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 you know, whose counsel, whose advice, whose word are you, who are you relying on? Not to just to do my will, the, the, the Syrian king is saying. Verse 21, now behold, you trust on the staff of this bruised reed upon Egypt. So he's assuming that they're trusting on the Egyptians to pull their chestnuts out of the fire, okay? On which a man leans, it'll go into his hand and pierce it. So is Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to all who trust in him. In other words, he's just mocking. You're going to rely on these Egyptians? They run, you know, when we fight them. But if you say to me, we trust in the Lord our God. Is he not the one whose high places and whose altars Hezekiah has taken away and said to Judah and Jerusalem, you shall worship before this altar in Jerusalem? Yeah, Hezekiah had done a lot to reform the worship in Israel because it had become idolatrous. And when he came into power, he undid a lot of what his father had, who, who was a poor example, had allowed. And it's interesting, the Assyrians had intelligence on this. They knew what was going on within his kingdom. And now please give pledges to my Lord, the king of Assyria, and I will deliver 2,000 horses to you if you are able to set riders upon them. So here he's mocking them. He says, you know, here it is. Here we are. You know, look at all my troops. Look at all my uh, cavalrymen, all my horses. He said, I'll even give you 2,000 horses for a fight if you can put anybody on them who can stay on them and fight. He's mocking them. He's really dissing them. Verse 24. How will you turn away the face of one commander, the least of my master's servants, servants, and put your trust in Egypt for chariots and for horsemen? 
<clears throat> have I now come up against this place to destroy it without the Lord? So now he's going to try a little, oh, God sent me here to do it. So he's going to try to undermine him from that way. He's, going to, he's trying to sow doubt in his mind. You think you're, you know, you think you're relying on God. God sent us to do this. The Lord said to me, go up against this land and destroy it. <clears throat> he's lying. <laughs> but that's okay. There are all sorts of people who lie. Okay. Fake news. All right. I mean, all's fair in love and war. <laughs> Verse 26. Then Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, and Shebna and Joah said to the uh, chief field commander, Please speak to your servants in Aramaic, for we understand it. And don't talk to, the, uh, to us in the Jews' language, in the hearing of all the people who are on the wall. See, they were sitting right outside the city gates, and they were having this conversation, and this Syrian guy is, is shouting all this out. With psychological warfare, he's trying to undermine the confidence, the faith of the people. The faith of the people in their God, that they had been, the belief that they've been raised in, and in their king, from that aspect, that he, you know, he, their leader. Verse 27, the chief field commander said to them, Has my master sent me to your master and to speak to you these words and not to the men who sit on the wall and who will eat? their own dung and drink their own urine with you. That's pretty nasty, isn't it? You know, when people get really hungry in some of those ancient sieges, it is a problem. Of course, they wanted something to drink. He didn't know about Hezekiah's tunnel that Hezekiah had dug, dug through solid bedrock to take water from a nearby spring and place it inside the city walls. You see, he didn't know that one. That, but it's still there too, by the way. It's, it's, it's archaeological evidence. Verse 28, And the chief field commander stood and cried in a loud voice in the Jews' language and spoke, saying, Hear the words of the great king, the king of Assyria. Thus says the king, do not let Hezekiah deceive you, for he will not be able to deliver you out of his hand. And do not let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord, saying, the Lord will surely deliver us, and this city shall not be delivered in the hands of the king of Assyria. Do not hearken to Hezekiah, for this, uh, thus says the king of Assyria, make peace with me by our present. In other words, Pay me off right now with everything you've got of any value, your gold and silver. And come out to me, and you will eat of his vine. Let each of you eat of his vine and, and each of his fig tree, and you shall each drink the water of his own cistern. There's a little caveat, however. Verse 32. Until I come and take you away to a land like your own land, a land of grain and new wine, a land of bread and vineyards, a land of olive oil and of honey, that you may live and not die. And do not listen to Hezekiah when he delivers you, saying, The Lord will deliver us. Has any of the gods of the nations at all delivered his land out of the hand of the king of Assyria? And, of course... You know, they knew the news of all astronomy. They knew what the Syrians had done. You know, you can only go, you only have to go, like the British Museum. If you're ever in London, stop in at the British Museum and go to the hall where they have all these carvings, beautiful stone carvings that they pulled out of the palace of the king. I think it was Nineveh, I believe, if I got the right city. And it shows exactly what they did to all these nations. They knew all the rumors and accounts of how the Syrians had destroyed all these people. They really knew it, and it was scary because, you know, the Syrians, when they would take a city, you know, they'd leave little mementos of their visit. Uh, they'd cut off all the heads of all the men of war, leave them as a little pyramid, and they'd impale the king and his, and his sons on stakes. You know, it was, they were nasty, nasty guys. Let's go to verse 19, uh, chapter 19, chapter 19. Then it came to pass, when King Hezekiah heard... He tore his clothes and covered himself with sackcloth. And he went into the house of the Lord. It's a sign of humility, by the way. And he sent Eliakim, who was over the household, and Shubna the scribe, and the elders of the priests, covered with sackcloth, to Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amaz. And they said to him, Thus says Hezekiah, This is a day of trouble and of rebuke and contempt. For the children have come to the point of birth, and there is no strength to bring forth. In other words, we're toast. <laughs> we're, we're had, Hezekiah. I mean, Hezekiah is saying to Isaiah, you know, we are in big, big 
trouble. It's sort of like, you know, if you, you saw this movie, recent movie about Dunkirk, or you saw the movie about Churchill recently that, uh, that they've had, the British at a certain point there in June 1940, when Churchill be, uh, was finally made prime minister, they were in deep trouble as a nation. The Nazis had, could overpower them. All they had to do was get across the channel. That's all they had to do. Verse 4, it may be, you know, I, the men that Hezekiah sent to Isaiah, and they are continuing on his message to the prophet, it may be that the Lord your God will hear all the words that the chief field commander, which he has, uh, uh, with which his master, the king of Assyria, has sent to reproach the living God, and will rebuke the words which the Lord your God has heard. See, Hezekiah is saying, yeah, I know God has heard this. I say, you know, you know, God has been he's, he's listening to all this, what's going on. And you shall lift up a prayer for the rest who are left. Because everybody else in his kingdom, all the other cities, had been taken by the Assyrians. Yeah, I've been down to Lachish when I was there, and I've seen the siege ramp that the Assyrians built up to the city wall of Lachish, which was the second uh, largest city in the kingdom of Judah, and how they'd gone through it and destroyed, you know, and taking all those people captive. That is some from the this, from this siege in Lachish. That, those are some of the scenes that are portrayed in the walls of these murals at the British Museum. It's amazing. The evidence is there. And the servants of the king Hezekiah uh, came to Isaiah, and Isaiah said to them, You shall say to your master, Thus says the Lord, you know, the YHVH, Do not be afraid of the words which you have heard, with which the servants of the king of Assyria has blasphemed me. Behold, I will send a blast upon him, and he shall hear a rumor, and shall return to his own land, and I will cause him to fall by the sword in his own land." Now, the account continues to go on here in chapter 19. The Assyrian king would send threatening letters. He, you know, he, he was threatening. He continued, he, he hit it one more time. I am going to annihilate you. I am going to make mush out of you. And he, I mean, he was, he, he was literally laying it on. Let's go to chapter 19 and let's go to verse 10. Thus you shall speak to Hezekiah, king of Assyria, saying, do not let your God in whom you trust deceive you, saying Jerusalem will not be delivered in the hand of the king of Assyria. Behold, you've heard what the kings of Assyria have done to all the lands by completely destroying them. And so shall you be delivered? Have the gods of the nations delivered them? Nations which my fathers have destroyed? Gozan and Haran. He goes through this whole, you know, he starts listing, you know, see what we've done to all these places. Where is the king of Hamath and the king of Arpad and the king of the city of the Shepharvaim of Hena and of Eva? Well, you know, they were like, you know, they were, they were like slugs stuck on a stick, you know, from this standpoint. And Hezekiah received the letters from the hand of the messengers and read it. And Hezekiah went up into the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord. You know, you get a real picture, you know. The, he gets this letter threatening him with, you know, being stuck on a stick, you know, on a sharpened stake. And, you know, he, 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 he takes it says, you know, and he says, verse 15, And Hezekiah prayed before the Lord and said, O Lord God of Israel, who dwells between the cherubim, you are God himself, you alone of all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made the heavens and the earth. Lord, bow down your ear and hear. Lord, O oh Lord, open your eyes and see and hear the words of Sennacherib, which he has sent to reproach the living God. And he confesses, truly, Lord, the kings of Assyria have destroyed the nations and their lands. They have thrown their gods into the fire. For they were no gods, but the work of men's hands, wood and stone, and they have destroyed them. And now, O Lord our God, I beseech you to <laughs> save us out of his hand, so that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you are the Lord God, and you are alone. You only. You alone. <clears throat> and Isaiah, the son of Amoz, sent to Hezekiah, saying, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I have heard what you have prayed to me against Sennacherib, king of Assyria. This is 
the word of the Lord has spoken concerning him. The virgin, the daughter of Zion, has despised you and laughed you to scorn. The daughter of Jerusalem has shaken her head at you. Whom have you mocked and blasphemed? And against whom have you exalted your voice and lifted up your eyes on high, even against the Holy One of Israel? You have mocked the Lord by your messengers, and you have said, With the multitude of my chariots I have come up to the height of the mountains, to the sides of Lebanon, and I will cut down its tall cedar trees, its, its choice fir trees, and I have entered into the lodgings of its borders, its densest forest. I have dug the drunk foreign waters, and with the sole of my feet I have dried up the rivers of Egypt. All these languages saying, you know, you think you're tough. You, you know, you, you, you think you're, you're powerful? Then he says, verse 25, Have you not heard, heard it from afar, that I made it? From the days of old, that I fashioned it? Yeah, I, I made all this stuff. God says, I, you know, I, I've done this, and I have caused it to come to pass that you should make fortified cities desolate heaps of rumor, ruins. Yeah, I allowed it. Verse 26, Therefore their people had little power. They were fearful and put to shame. They were like the grass of the field and the green herbs, like the grass of the housetops, and like the grain blasted before it is grown up because of heat. And the heat comes, it shrivels it all up. But I know you're sitting down, God says to Sennacherib. You know, I can see you right where you are, sitting down and you're going out, you're coming in and your rage against me. Because of your rage against me and because of your arrogance has come up into my ears, even I will put a hook in your nose and a bridle in your lips. Which, if you look at some of the Syrian wall carvings, that's what they used to do to their prisoners, some of them anyways. And I will turn you back by the way by which you came. So God was saying he would, no. In verse 34, you go down, for I will defend the city and save it for my own sake and for my servants David's sake. And then it goes through the account that at that, that night, the angel of the Lord went out, verse 35, and struck 185,000 in the camp of the Assyrians. And when they rose in the morning, yep, the Assyrian king got up in the morning Behold, they were all dead bodies. And the next thing he did was hightail it back to Assyria, where he ended up getting murdered when he went to his idolatrous pagan temple to worship his god. One of his sons decided he wanted to be king instead, king for the day, you know, for that sort of thing. What God said he accomplished, he did. Now, faith is that which provides us with confident assurance with regards to the things we hope for. It serves by way of convincing us about things which cannot be seen. You know, there's an interesting piece of news that hit, uh, that hit the media that I picked up this week that according to Hebrew University archaeologist Dr. Elat Mazar, she said this, she made an announcement. We appear to have discovered a seal impression which may have belonged to the prophet Isaiah in a scientific archaeological excavation. Dr. Mirzar's team uncovered the minuscule bulli or seal. Okay, this is a blow up of it. Or seal impression during a renewed excavation in an area of of the Temple Mount area called the Ophel, okay? It's just outside it. It's, it's just beyond the southern wall of the Temple Mount. The oval-shaped bulla, however, is not intact. You can see there is a little portion of it that's missing, okay? On its legible portion, there's an inscription written in First Temple Hebrew um, letters, because the style changed after the Babylonian captivity, that says, belonging to Isaiah. Okay, that's the middle line. On the bottom line, there is a partial well, word, the three letters N, V, Y in Hebrew, which could spell out the first letter, first three letters of a four-word, four-letter Hebrew word for prophet. Now the 
But the bullet was damaged in the last letter, which was, uh, if it was the prophet, an aleph is missing, which would have definitively and, uh, and incontroversibly proven that the seal, this was the seal of Isaiah the prophet. Instead, you know, because the one letter is missing at the end, the skeptics say, ah, it could have been somebody who lived in nearby Nob or something like this. Well, there's the, you know, there's, it's, it's, it's not uncontrovertible proof. And yet, you know, of the whole thing, just to let you know, this Isaiah seal, it is, does I say definitely Isaiah, you know, not NAV, the first three letters of the word prophet of the four, if it was, was found only 10 feet away in the same stratigraphy or the excavation layer and in the same context at the ancient king of Judah's palace compound there in Jerusalem, where in 2015, three years ago, Mazar's team, the archaeologist Mazar's team, discovered an actual intact seal or a bullai of King Hezekiah himself. A seal that probably the impression had been made by the hand of Hezekiah himself. Is this a mere coincidence? You see when reading scriptures that the prophet Isaiah and King Hezekiah had a close working relationship with each other. But there is one letter missing off the Isaiah seal, which allows a skeptic deniability, plausible deniability, something they can argue to their heart's content. Scriptures say the just will live by faith. Does God, you know, does, you know, how does God work in the lives of his people? We have a whole biblical account. There's all sorts of evidence. It's very interesting. The invisible God work to turn away a destruction by an, one, of the ancient, one of the ancient world's major powers, save his people. Psalm 37, turn with me to Psalm 37. One of my favorite psalms is Psalm 37, verse 23. I'm going to read it in the Amplified Bible version. <laughs> the steps of a good and righteous man are directed and established by the Lord and he delights in his way. And the Amplified notes, and he blesses his path. You know, this next week, this next week, beginning on Wednesday evening, at the beginning of Wednesday evening, after the sun has gone down, February 28th, and ending the, um, the evening of March 1st, is what's called the Jewish Festival of Purim. In English, Purim translates as the festival of the casting of lots, or perhaps, if you want to put it this way, the festival of chance. <laughs> yeah, chance, festival of unlikely coincidences. Coincidence that according to this festival, God directs. You know, the idea of casting lots, the idea of Purim is not a stranger to the New Covenant Scriptures, to the Greek New, New Covenant Scriptures either. We, you know, you read in all four Gospel accounts stories about the Roman soldiers after crucifying Jesus, what did they do? They cast lots for his clothes because they were worth something. They didn't want to tear them up, give each one a little piece of cloth which would, in the marketplace wouldn't get you anything. So they cast lots you had to, for Jesus' robe, for his clothes. But more notably, the whole idea of casting lots or Purim from this aspect was something that actually the church did do. If you turn with me to Acts chapter 1, first chapter in the book of Acts, and verse 25, I'm going to read this in the expanded Bible version. It comes in here. You know, obviously things are just getting going here. Jesus has was crucified. He was resurrected. The Apostles saw him go into heaven and said, hang around here until the day of Pentecost. And they said, okay, we've got to set things in order here. What are we going to do? And the apostles prayed and said, Lord, and here's Acts chapter 1 and verse 25, Lord, you know the thoughts of everyone. Show us which of these two you have chosen to do this work and to be an apostle. Because they were going to replace Judas. Judas who had betrayed Jesus, who had lost faith in what God, what, you know, 
in the, what Jesus had told them and what Jesus, you know, and all the, the he had lost faith that Jesus was the Messiah and had betrayed him. Or at least doing it the way Jesus wanted to do it. Show us which of these two, two men, two candidates to replace uh, uh, Judas in the, among the 12 apostles to do this work, uh, to, to be an apostle in place of Judas who turned away and went where he belongs, in other words, to his death, to his destruction. Then they used lots. They cast lots to choose between them. Now, this, this was something that was, this practice was well established in Leviticus 16, 18, Numbers 26, 55, Numbers 33, 54, Joshua 19, 1 to 4, when they divided up the land, 1 Samuel 23, 6, and the lots showed that Matthias, that is Matthew, was the one, and he became or was counted in his apostle with the other 11. So the idea of using lots, of chance, of unlikely coincidence to decide something important, biblical theme. The backstory of the Jewish festival of Purim, which begins next week, is recounted in the canonical book of Esther. It's in our Bible. It's proved reading which is part of the Hebrew scriptures known as of the three divisions. You have the law, the prophets, in which Isaiah, the book of Isaiah is, and then you have the writings, which in the book of, in this section of scripture, you have things like the book of Psalms, you have the book of Daniel, you have Ezra, Nehemiah, the Proverbs, Lamentations, you know, these, these types of books. The book of Esther, is very unusual in the scriptures. God's name is never directly mentioned in the book of Esther. In some ways, is what does this say? He seems hidden somehow. He seems in the background, out of sight at this time, because the book of Esther takes place after the southern kingdom of Judah will be destroyed. Well, I guess it was uh, more than about, it was about 120 years after Hezekiah's death. Yeah, about 120 years after those events that uh, we just read about Hezekiah and the prophet Isaiah and the king of Assyria. Nevertheless, the book of Esther clearly implies, even though God's name is not mentioned, that God was stage managing, if you would, the action that was taking place and that was recounted in this canonical book. And it's the, what we see when you read through it. All things were going to somehow, remarkably, unexpectedly work out for the heroes of the story. The main hero, of course, in this book was a young Jewish woman whose name in Hebrew was Hadassah, which is perhaps best translated into Hebrew as compassion. You know, it's just like in, in Canada, we had one of our figure skaters who gained gold. Her, her last name was Virtue. <laughs> well, Hadassah means compassion, which is why oftentimes you will find hospitals in the land of Israel called Hadassah, Hadassah Hospital, this sort of thing. Or even there's an organization of Hadassah, which collects to do good works for those who need help. But Hadassah's name in Persian, because she, she had another name, it, it was Esther, which translates into Persian as star, you know, a shining star in the, in the sky. And it would turn out to be quite an accurate name as well. The second good guy in the story of Esther was uh, Esther's Uncle Mordecai. But, you know, you know, everyone should have an Uncle Mordecai. <laughs> Teamed up, Esther and Mordecai would frustrate, you know, basically the book accounts and reverse the genocidal plans that the uh, that would happen during the reign of the Persian king Ashwaris, which is what it's counted. Or we understand historically that this was Xerxes. He had a prime minister who hated the Jews. He was a long time, he was an Agagite, which meant he was of the Amalekites. And if you know your scriptures, you know from the time of Moses that there was bad blood between Israel and the Amalekites because the Amalekites would attack them on the way out of, you know, out of Egypt. 
So we understand, we know historically that Xerxes, his reign was from 486 to 465, and that he was called the Hashwiris. You know, much of the historical detail about Xerxes' reign was preserved by the Greek historian Herodotus in his History of the Persian Wars. And Herodotus' account about the Persian Empire and how it was run, you know, has shows the strong historicity of the Book of Esther and things like accounts the Persian postal system which they had, the extent of the empire and its provinces, the keeping of official diaries, the use of impalement as a form of punishment. All these things are confirmed as, well, this is the way it, you know, Herodotus says, yeah, that's how it was. You know, what Esther accounts. Now the events you know, when the book of Esther starts, and if you turn with me, let's, let's go to the book of Esther here in the writings. When you see when the book starts in Esther chapter 1 and verse 3, in the third year of King Xerxes or King Ashwerus' reign, he made a feast for all his princes and his servants, the army of Persia and Media, the nobles and princes of the provinces were before him. When he showed the splendors and the riches of his glorious kingdom, and the splendor of his excellent majesty, many days, 180 days. The first kings you knew, knew how to carry on parties. <laughs> they knew about how to put on a party that I think, you know, they had they, they, better than anything we've ever seen. But this would occur in the third year of Xerxes, you know, some about, you know, with 480, you know, probably in the way we would count time, B.C. Now, when it starts here in Esther chapter 1 and verse 3, it then would skip down in Esther chapter 2 and 16. You see all of a sudden that after, you know, that you had a, dis, um, he deposed his queen Vashti and would look for successor and would choose Esther. And you see this in Esther chapter 2 and verse 16. So Esther was taken to King Ahasuerus in his royal house in the 10th month, in the month of that, in the seventh year of his reign. Seventh year of his reign. And the king loved Esther above all the women. And she rose in grace and favor in his sight more than all the other virgins. And he set the royal crown upon her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. Instead of Vashti. Now this, as we see, actually this event coincides historically, we know it, with his seventh year, which was, out of all curious things, coincides, it happened between the first reference in his third year to his seventh. Why was there a four-year gap between deposing his queen and installing a new one? Well, it turns out Xerxes was in Greece, <laughs> fighting the Greeks during this exact period of time so it did you know all this uh, it, you know that period of that gap in time it coincides exactly with Xerxes absence from Persia so you see the timing is even there we know from their historicity that it's there but you know when you start reading the book secular scholars consider the book of Esther and his story to be coincidences remarkable improbable coincidences probably more fiction than fact for certain, though I've, I'm certain they never heard of Ripley's Believe It or Not. You know, there are remarkable things that seem improbable that are, you know, that are true. They're not fiction. You know, after all, when you look at the whole story of, of this ancient people, the Hebrews, even though their nation state would be finally, the, the kingdom of Judah would be totally destroyed in 587 by the Babylonians, and it, you know, it, we, they didn't disappear from history. A lot of these ancient people, you know, they no longer maintain their identity the same way. Although, curiously, the Persians still know they're quite Persians. You know, there are players who do know these things. But it would be from the time of, you know, that the kingdom that Hezekiah had ruled and then his successors, it would be 2,000, over 2,500 years before the Jews would regain their sovereignty. This year, is a, they're going to celebrate the 70th year Oh, they're regaining their sovereignty. And of all interesting coincidences, the United States is deciding to move the embassy from Tel Aviv to actually the capital of Jerusalem. 
This is a remarkable thing. Just the existence of the state of Israel, which is really the state of Judah, if you would, but the existence of the state of Israel, it's Ben Gurion who said that, maybe it was prophetic, who knows. Anyways, let's go to Jeremiah 31 and verse 23. Seems improbable, but scripture said it would happen. In Jeremiah chapter 31 and verse 23, I'm going to read this in the Holman Christian Standard Bible. This is what the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, says, When I restore their fortunes, that is the fortunes of the children of Israel, they will once again speak this word. And according to the, the lexicon, it means this speech, Hebrew, in the land of Judah and its city. So it's speaking of the land of Judah. They're going to speak Hebrew in the land of Judah. May the Lord bless you, righteous settlement, my holy mountain. One of the, you know, one of the first things when they established the state of Israel, the official language is Hebrew. And it's, it's, it is very much a living language. Improbable. From the time of Jeremiah, when the nation was being destroyed at that point in time by the Babylonians, saying, yeah, it's gonna, they're still going to speak about it. I will restore the fortunes. That was a promise. Did God do it? Improbable as it might sound, over 2,500 years. Still, going back to Esther, scholars think it's improbable for Xerxes to have a Jewish queen at the time. But then... When Xerxes picked Esther, he really didn't know who she was, did he? If you see, look here in Esther chapter 2 and verse uh, 20. It says very clearly, after Esther was picked and made queen, Esther had not yet revealed her kindred nor her people as Mordecai had commanded her. For Esther obeyed in the, the command of Mordecai as she did when she was brought up by him. She had been an orphan. She simply told the king she was an orphan. With somebody without family, in the ancient world, a queen without family but might have been seen as a, as a handicap in some because you couldn't rely on more help from an orphan who didn't have family as far as in maintaining your rule. But on the second hand, she didn't have any baggage. <laughs> There'd be no line of people asking for favors. And you know, the, the history of all the ancient empires, these kings, I don't care whether you're talking about the Babylonians, the Assyrians, you know, whoever it might have been, the, the, the Mongols, you know, <laughs> they had foreign queens. It is something that was very, it wasn't improbable. And for the fact that you had this whole thing of an identity that wasn't revealed, you know, even one of the 20th century's greatest murder mystery writers, Agatha Christie, constantly, repeatedly used this theme of an undisclosed or misleading identity as one of her main literary devices for her mystery stories. Very popular. And the audiences never found this improbable. And yet skeptics would say it's an un, you know, unlikely event, improbable. Skeptics also consider it improbable that Mordecai's, you know, helpful intelligence about Xerxes' life not being rewarded at the right time when it happened, but only later, just merely hours before this Prime Minister Haman, who was seeking uh, to kill all the Jews, would come in and arrive for his life. And if you read the story here in Esther chapter 6 and verses 1 to 14, You'll see that instead of getting Mordecai hung on the gallows, Haman was going to have to take him out and run around the city and sh shout his praises. He's, you know, he was completely set up for humiliation. God set him up for humiliation. You know, skeptics also doubt the historicity of the Me Too event of later Haman falling on Hester's, Esther's couch when she was having a feast with him. And, you know, if, if, for Haman and the king, she'd set up all this thing to confront Haman. And Haman fell on her couch and the king came back and said, well, he raped the queen in my presence. You know, it was a Me Too event. People doubt that. Well, I don't know. After all we've seen here recently and hear all these things, why would that be seen unlikely? You think human nature has changed, that that didn't happen, that sort of thing in ancient Persia? I don't think so. Uh, you know, how is that, Im you know, Im improbable? 
How are the events of the book of Esther mere improbable events, acts? Is it improbable that there was an attempted genocide of the Old Covenant people of God? I don't know. Things don't change much, do they? What's the situation right now? The successors of the Persians of that time are who? It's the Iranians. <laughs> Are the Iranians really in love with the Jews in the state of Israel? No. One of the probably the biggest threats in 2018 is that there could be actually, not because they want it, not because the Israelis or the Iranians want it, but there could be a war between them. It's getting set up for that right now. A big one in 2018. Let's go to Romans chapter 8 and verse 28. Romans 8 and verse 28. I'm going to read this from the Amplified Bible version. And we know, the editors of Amplified put it, add on the, to make, get the point, and we know with great confidence that God, who is deeply concerned about us, causes all things to work together to work together in the, in the Amplified Editor's Note as a plan for good for those who love God to those who are called according to his plan and purpose. Or as Kazir would put it, moreover, we ourselves know that for those who love God, all things work together to secure their good. For those, I mean, whom he has called in fulfillment of his design. Did God indeed work a plan, fulfillment of the sign through Esther and Mordecai to confront and confound Haman's plans of killing all the Jews in the ancient Persian Empire, which included the settlement that had been reestablished in the land of Judah and Jerusalem under Esther and Nehemiah? Ezra. Ezra. Ezra and Nehemiah, excuse me. You know, the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. You can read the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. Did he frustrate? by a series of improbable events. <laughs> well, you know, if, if he hadn't, the people of Jesus of Nazareth would have been all killed. His, his ancestors would have been all killed. Yeah, God has a plan. He's working. That all things God causes to work together has a plan for good for those who love God, to those who are called according to his plan and purpose. Let's go to Romans now in chapter 9 and verse 29. It's very interesting. Paul is citing Isaiah the prophet, Hezekiah's chief, one of his chief counselors. As, the, as, as it is Isaiah foretold, if the Lord of hosts had not left us a seed, that is, future generations from which a remnant would of Israelites, faithful people, would come. We would have become like Sodom. We would have resembled Gomorrah, which if you know the story of Sodom and Gomorrah and the sin that they were engaged in, caused them to be totally rejected and destroyed by God. Let's go to Romans 11 and verse 25. God's plan that he's working out for those who is called according to his purpose. Romans 11, 25. I want you to understand this mystery, dear brothers and sisters. Apostle Paul is writing to the brethren living at Rome. So that you will not feel proud about yourselves. Yeah, because if you're living in the capital city of the Roman Empire, you tend to look down on everybody else, okay? Because you are the hot shots. <coughs> Some of the people of Israel have hard hearts, Paul was saying, but this will last only until the full number of Gentiles, the non-Jewish people, come in, comes to Christ. See, God has a plan. He's planning. In verse 26, Paul says this, and so all Israel will be saved. That's a remarkable scripture. Should give pause to anyone who has harbors anti-Semitic thoughts or hatred for the Jewish people. And so all Israel will be saved. Does the scriptures say, the one who rescues, or the liberator, the one who saves, will come to Zion. Literally, you know, it's, it's literally Zion. Some 
translation versions. This one is the New Living Translation, say Jerusalem. Yes, it is Jerusalem, but it's Zion. He will come to Zion and will turn Israel away from ungodliness. That's God's plan. And this is my covenant with them. He says, this is my covenant that I will take away their sins. Many of the people of Israel, Paul goes on, are now enemies of the good news, and this benefits you Gentiles. In the first century, they were. The establishment to the Jewish establishment that were running the temple state, Paul knew that. He just had, you know, had just had this experience, if you can read in the book of Acts. And it still continues to be true in many ways. If you were in the state of Israel right now, you know, stand on the street corner and preach the gospel, if you would, would might probably get you in trouble because they have no unproselytizing laws because, of course, for the last 1,900 years, a lot of people who said they were Christians treated them like absolute dirt. They said they were Christians, but they didn't love their neighbor as themselves. They didn't do what Jesus said. Yet they are still the people, Paul says, he loves because he chose their ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Then he makes this point, for God's gifts and his call can never be withdrawn. Or as the ESV, the English Standard Version puts it, for the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. He has a plan. He is going to work it. He is going to do it. You can see this. That's what the book of Purim is all about. So as in the past, so today, the God of the Bible can and does work through improbable circumstances and events for the good of those who believe that he exists and will reward them for the faith that they continually put in him to help them in their times of trouble. Brethren, let's have faith. For we have not believed in fiction. We believed in the truth, believe it or not. 